Jisung and Jin Young really just went ahead and did that for the gays. Like, wow. Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. One, yes, my hair is a different color. I dyed it last month, it's blue, probably doesn't show up really well here, and I'm also re it because obviously blue fades. It's a thing, it happened. Sorry, the chucks, anyone. That's number one. Number two, this is gonna be kinda long. Like, I'm not even shitting. I had to write stuff down. Strap yourselves in. Today we're gonna be talking about a brand new K-drama. Like, no joke, it literally finished airing like last week, two weeks ago, maybe three depending on when I got this up. <laughs> but at the time of right now, which is September 1st, I think it was like last week. Could have been the week before, so I could be wrong. And this is called The Devil Judge, or as I believe the Hangul reads, Angma Pansa. Now, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I could have misremembered a grammar rule in there. I'm gonna apologize that you're gonna see me looking down. Like I said, I had to write down everything or else I was going to forget. So if I look like I'm doing this a lot, it is because I am reading out all of the information that I had to write down so that I didn't forget anything and because there is a lot. Oh, I should also note this review is very likely to have spoilers and I will probably not tag them out because it's going to be crucial to like the entirety of this discussion. Sorry. The Devil Judge is a dystopia mystery slash legal revenge thriller set in a fictional future South Korea where, at least as far as I could gather from the diegetic, like, news recordings they were giving me, some kind of plague, pandemic, like, contagion, uh, I think has led to, like, the collapse of numerous societal systems and everything is chaos. Like, the class divide between rich and poor is so vast that when the show has one particular character drive through Seoul to show us the differences between the two, the stark and steep contrast is enough to give the viewer whiplash. But most importantly, as it pertains right now to, say, like, world building or setting up this dystopia, it is the enmity and distrust the people have towards the judicial system that comes to the forefront. Trust in the judiciary and say things like the prosecution are at an all time low. So much so that the current president, a former actor who behaves more like a circus ringleader than he does any kind of viable political force, and that is not an accident, lands upon the idea of what he calls the live court show and it is kind of what you think it is, criminal trials are broadcast live out to the country and the people themselves via an app get to participate by voting as to whether they find a defendant guilty or not guilty or whether they think they deserve a harsh punishment or a lenient one. Now look, I'm not gonna pretend to be any kind of like authority on the South Korean judicial system because lol I'm not, but I will say that this show does at least keep to an aspect I've noticed to be kind of like a norm throughout most um, like legal or court related K-dramas that I've seen, which is that we have a bench trial as opposed to a jury trial. What I mean by this is that trials are presided over by a panel of three judges, a head judge and two associate judges, as opposed to having a jury of their peers which it seems like, at least from a couple K-dramas I've watched that have had jury trials, it needs to be requested by either the defense or the prosecution. So again, this is, someone can correct me if I'm wrong in this observation, because it really is just my observation. And if anybody knows anything and wants to share down below to the class, please do, I'm actually interested. But of course, the fact that we have a bench trial and three judges leads us to our titular devil judge himself, Kang Yohan as portrayed brilliantly and charismatically by Ji Sung. Now, for those of you who have not had the pleasure of watching a Ji Sung K drama, um, he's an extremely well known, well loved actor in drama world, and he's probably best remembered by many people for his incredible turn in the 2015 drama Kill Me, Heal Me, in which he played a young man with dissociative identity disorder. And that includes all like something like seven to nine altars that the man possesses. Now these altars run the gamut of ages, genders, personality types, and even dialects. Like I'm not even kidding, there's one altar that speaks entirely in Satori, which for those of you who don't know, Satori means a particular dialect. And there's even one that is basically a teenage girl who is obsessed with good looking guys. As she says, all good looking men are oppa. And like, it's fabulous. It's iconic. This means, of course, he is the perfect 
choice to play a character like Kang Yohan, a man who more than once in the course of the show even refers to himself as a devil or a monster. Now, what's smart about the devil judge in that respect is in posing the question of just how monstrous is he when compared with the world around him? See, one of the major thematic through lines of the Devil Judge is the idea that in order to catch monsters, one must become monstrous themselves. The drama therein comes from a character either A, choosing whether or not they wish to do that, as is the case with the character of Kim Ga-on played by Jin Young, or B, depending just how monstrous they will become in order to achieve their goal, and or C, their motivations behind making such a decision. Now, such an idea is not new to storytelling and not even to K-dramas. In fact, within the past year alone, we had two massive dramas pose the same kind of theme, which were the very rightfully award-winning Komul, also known by its English title Beyond Evil, which is now available on Netflix and you should go watch it. It won awards for reasons and they were good reasons, as well as the wildly popular Vincenzo. In a way, The Devil Judge actually takes a combination of these two shows in presenting us with a wildly charismatic devil for a protagonist in the same way that Vincenzo does, while also maintaining a second male lead who represents an optimistic, if perhaps naive or even self-righteous, desire to believe in the power of the justice system to do the right thing if one follows its rules, in the same way that Komu does with the character played by Yojin Gu. As with all of these, there aren't really heroes and villains so much as protagonists and antagonists. Now look, I know this could sound like I'm nitpicking over semantics, but I actually think these semantics are kind of important. Heroes and villains are not the same as protagonists and antagonists. <laughs> A protagonist is simply that, the main character of the story in question. Thus, the antagonist in that regard is simply a person who is against the protagonist. Now, while traditionally these two are placed respectively in their roles as their given story's esoteric hero or villain, they are not always so, especially when we consider our theme of becoming monsters to hunt monsters. A really great non-K-drama example of this would be the 1969 film The Wild Bunch. Directed by Sam Peckinpah, the film details what are ultimately the final adventures and days of a legendary group of outlaw gunfighters. Though they are our protagonists, they are most certainly not what anybody would label as heroes. In fact, the infamous opening sequence is the titular Wild Bunch robbing a town which erupts into a gunfight in which many innocent bystanders are killed. It just so happens that the film ends up pitting the Wild Bunch against someone even worse in the form of the film's ultimate antagonist, General Matpache. And I'm very sorry if I mispronounce this, it's been a long time since I watched The Wild Bunch. Now, these, this film's violent sequences aren't called infamous for no reasons, like, and they remain controversial to this day. It's kind of urban legend, though maybe it did happen, that people were like throwing up in the theater out of, or just leaving out of shock, especially as this was one of the first films to use, one, different gunfire sound effects for the different guns used. And if I'm remembering my film classes correctly, it was one of the first films to use that like air propelled like blood splatter that is now commonplace effect for bullet wounds in films. Um, and I, it had been pioneered like two years or so earlier by Bonnie and Clyde. But thus I also mentioned this film for another reason, which is what Peckinpah himself said with regard to the violence of his film. The point of the film is to take this facade of movie violence and open it up get people involved in it so they are starting to go in the Hollywood television predictable reaction syndrome, and then twist it so that it's not fun anymore. Just a wave of sickness in the gut. It's ugly, brutalizing, and bloody awful. It's not fun and games and cowboys and Indians. It's a terrible, ugly thing, and yet there's a certain response that you get from it, and excitement, because we're all violent people. Peckinpah was attempting to use violence as a kind of catharsis because he believed the audience would be purged of violence by witnessing it explicitly on screen, sort of like exercising a demon vicariously. Now, unfortunately for Peckinpah, he was ultimately kind of proven mistaken in the long run, as he later admitted to being really troubled by how the audience seemed to enjoy the violence as opposed to being horrified by it. What does that have to do with the Devil Judge? Well, Kang Yo Han utilizes a lot of the same psychology with regard to his live court show. So with that in mind, we actually need, do need to talk about Kang Yo Han as a character because like he's important. <laughs> he administers a very like Hammurabi Code-esque style of justice within his courtroom with a definite eye for an eye setting. That's important because you need to remember that 
The idea of the live court show is that it's not just a legal criminal trial, it's television. And Johan utilizes the media in this regard perfectly. In fact, honestly, I think The Devil Judge is refreshingly honest with its self-awareness, not only of the fact that it itself is a media narrative, but that the live court show is equally a media narrative as much as it is a criminal proceeding. And Johan is the perfect person to head that process. And if you don't think this sh the live court show doesn't know its media, Kim Jae-kyung plays the character of Oh Jin-ju, who's the other associate judge alongside Kim Ga-on, and she even makes reference to the fact that she knows she was picked because of her face more than her actual intellect. In fact, that spurs her to work all the harder to feel like she then measures up to Kang Yohan, who was picked for his intellect. I mean, he's also disgustingly good looking because it's just... And again, I love that the show brings that up. They are very much acknowledging, no, we cast disgustingly beautiful people. Bonus points, they're actually judges and like they're good at their jobs, but like they're disgustingly beautiful people. So as for Kang Yohan, he is introduced as a judge known for following the letter of the law in rendering his verdicts, regardless of any of his personal feelings on any given case. This is detailed out in a scene that is a flashback where we see him dealing with a horrible abuse uh, case of domestic abuse case where the guy is claiming, ah, but I was drunk and the family's pleading for leniency. They probably don't really totally want it because they look terrified in the audience. And unfortunately, I do believe in Korea, if you are drunk, it makes you be considered like impaired or less culpable for your actions because you are then intellectually impaired. And you see Kang Yohan literally like ripping up the paper, he's scribbling his pen so hard. You can see that he is angry, but it doesn't matter. He delivers upon the letter of the law, which is that he gives the man a far reduced sentence. I sit there in rage as he was. Thus, Kang Yoha seems on the surface, the perfect person to present to like the hoi polloi brimming with distrust in their country's own legal system, especially as it pertains to the judiciary, make him the face. Perfect. He's presented as a man who will not be swayed by the elites in rendering his verdict and will properly listen to the Vox Populi, except they don't even consider how he himself might be manipulating said Vox Populi to fit the narrative that he wishes so that he can render the verdict that he wants, best demonstrated in the first and the second and the third trial that we see through the live court show. After all, Kang Yohan has now entered into this game of his own making, or so he thinks, <laughs> with the sole purpose of carrying out a revenge against those who would use the system to benefit themselves at the expense and usually the deaths of others. And so he offers the angry people what they want, monsters whom they can self-righteously judge with seeming moral ease until he makes them watch long enough to realize after a while, something like say a flogging, no, really there is a flogging in this show, isn't so fun anymore. It's actually sickening to watch someone get beaten over and over and over again, even if they are receiving something like a karmic-like punishment for years worth of physically violent behavior against others that was swept under the rug due to his power of societal position and money. And the audience of this world is not the only people who are meant to feel this. This is set upon us, the audience, as well. I'm not gonna lie, I watched the first episode of Devil Judge, which is almost an hour and a half and well worth it. And the case in question of the first episode is a very Aaron Brockovich-like case. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I, when I say Aaron Brockovich, she is a real person, made probably all the more famous by the film starring Julia Roberts, in which it dealt with a chemical company ultimately knowingly poisoning a town, telling them it was good for them and then later getting sued when like all those people got sick. Something similar happens in the first episode. And at the end, when the verdict is rendered and this guy is sentenced to like, something like almost 200 years worth of imprisonment and Kang Yohan just goes up and whispers, I hope you live a long life. I sat there like, oh, He done gone fucking did that. He did that. I loved it. And then when I got to the flogging, um, yes, there is that bit of me that is a vicious shit. As I said, as Peckinpah said, we are all violent people who went, yeah, you know what? This guy's an asshole and he terrorizes people, has done it for years and I'm sick of him trying to hide behind his mommy and daddy's money and he should get a taste of his own medicine. 
until you had to sit there and watch it for a while. And then it was like, oh, that's that's really not that fun anymore. Like, I shouldn't have been taking fun in this. Do I still think he deserved to be punished? Yes, but I'm not taking joy in it anymore. And then the case after that, which is actually meant to sort of be a hiccup to Kang Johan, because obviously he's pissing off the elites because he's putting the elites behind bars. <laughs> or flogging them in some cases, or at least their children. It is the case of a man who gets accused of basically like sexual assault by multiple women and the prosecution in league with the defense minister and other people who are the elites, AKA the people all in power says he wants to castrate him. Like not chemically, physically castrate the man, which there's a vicious part in all of us who probably all go goes, ooh. But then you realize if he does that and like the flogging, they broadcast it live, nobody's going to enjoy it. I'm sorry, I really don't think anybody wants to watch that, no matter how vicious we might be as people. Kang Yohan understands that because he has created the monster of people demanding worse and worse and worse punishments, it will reach a point where he will have to say no and that will immediately make the people turn on them because obviously as again, as I call it, the Vox Populi, the Hoi Polloi, it's mob mentality. That is what he is utilizing to bolster his sort of reign, his plan, the thing he has set in motion. And so what he does instead is he doesn't castrate the man, he instead decides to team up with the Texas legal system and penitentiary system because of course it's Texas. Of course it's Texas, where they have basically a supermax for sexual offenders and they decide to send the guy there, which, touche, touche. You basically guarantee this guy is going to be sending, spending something like 20 to 30 years behind bars with the very people who will put him in the same state of constant fear that he did his victims. Cause the idea is that he was sexually abusing and harassing women who were working under him. Therefore, you live in a culture of fear. Again, I speak of this Hammurabi code, the eye for an eye kind of deal. This is what Kang Yohan is doing. But of course, as you can imagine, at times, this does ultimately backfire upon him because unfortunately, in utilizing the mob mentality of the Hoi Polloi, that can easily be turned against him just as quickly, especially when we talk about the ease of fabricating evidence and manipulating it, which is like why people don't have trust in the justice system in this world to begin with, but <laughs> hey. <laughs> Which would mean, of course, I would be remiss if I did not discuss this show's favorite imagery related topic, which is like the biblical, the papal, the religious, the Catholic. I mean, yeah, you had to see this coming. It's called the devil judge. He calls himself a devil more than once. This show loves to play with the biblical, the papal, and the religious iconography, imagery, themes, naming schemes. Hell, Johann's own name is a Hangul transliteration of the name John. Fun fact for those of you who didn't know. <laughs> Quick tour down Bible lane here. There are two major figures in the Bible that at least I can think of that come to the top of my head named John, namely John the Baptist and the Apostle John who wrote, you know, the, the, the gospel according to John. Casual, I know. I actually briefly wanna mention the latter of these two Johns because the contents of said gospel, and I had to refresh myself on these, I will be honest. If I were to bullet point the gospel of John to you, it'd be, Prologue informs the readers of the true identity of Jesus, the word of God from through whom the world was created, blah, 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 took on human form. He came to the Jews and the Jews ultimately rejected him. But to all who received him, which is like the circle of Christian believers who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. Cool. Next part, book of signs. Jesus calls his disciples, begins his earthly ministry. This creates tensions with the religious authorities who decide that he must be eliminated. Rock on. Book of Glory, Jesus is returned to his heavenly father. He prepares his disciples for their coming lives without his physical presence and his prayer for himself and for them, followed by his betrayal, arrest, trial, crucifixion, and post-resurrection appearances. Then the conclusion sets out the purpose of the gospel, which is that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Cool, that was a really quick bullet points version of the gospel according to John. Now, yeah, there is an addendum, but I really don't want to dive into it because it's just more like post-resurrection appearances and shit. The important thing, <laughs> of why I bullet pointed this out to you is how, despite Kang Yohan absolutely not being a Jesus, like archetype or allegory in any way, the story of the devil judge and at least the story of Kang Yohan follows a really 
similar narrative blueprint as was laid out by the Gospel of John. I'm not even joking. Hear me out because I highly doubt this was an accident on the part of the writer. Ready? Johann is introduced. He begins the court show and immediately pisses off those in power who vow to bring him down. Johann continues and wins the love of the people only to then be just as swiftly rejected by them due to the manipulations of the people in power. Cool. Johann is betrayed, arrested, and then dies only to reappear. From there, he basically carries out the rest of his vengeance, but still leaves behind his pseudo disciple and more importantly lover, we'll get to that later, in the form of Kim Ga-on, who fully believes in Johann to the point of being willing to, on two different occasions, go kaboom for him. That's not a joke. Again, we'll sort of get to that later. Granted, of course, as we said, Johan is no Jesus. <laughs> Absolutely not. There's a reason we call this the, the devil judge and not like the savior judge. <laughs> and that's because Johan is no savior. He is, as I said before, someone who calls himself a devil. He is, however, a devil that sets out to take down even worse Sir Devils monster attacking on monsters. We've mentioned this. The difference between Johan and the people he seeks to destroy is actually really quite simple. It is the difference between selfishness and selflessness. You see, Johan makes himself out to be a devil by choice. He equally does things outside the boundary of the law, but also uses people's preconceived notions about him, even encouraging some people to believe the actual worst of him in order to smokescreen the truth that he is while not necessarily like a great person, not one to willingly or willfully harm the innocent. Ultimately, those he harms are those who in some way were a part of the death of his beloved young Yosef. Yes, that is a Hangul transliteris transliteration of Joseph. So more biblical slash Christian names going on here, but we're honestly gonna bypass the story time for anybody related to Joseph because quite frankly, he, he doesn't feature d enough directly in the narrative. Joseph exists mostly as a motivation for Johan and also to basically be the one person who was ever nice to him. That's why he loved his older brother. And who is also physically like a doppelganger for Kim Ga-on. Part of the reason Kim Ga-on comes into the narrative and what starts Johan's interest in him is the fact that he is a doppelganger for Yosef, to the point they had Jin Young play both roles. And if I had to give one critique of the show, like one real critique of the visuals of the show, Jin Young is significantly younger than Ji Sung, so when you have the flashback, you maybe should have just had somebody else play Johan because. There's no way in fucking hell I believed Jin Young was the Hyung in the relationship between Jin Young and Ji Sung, between Yosef and Johan. Like, show, like, it's my one nitpick. It's my one nitpick. That being said, we can talk about Johan's niece, who is Yosef's daughter, named Elia, whose name, again, we're doing Hangul transliterations. It is the transliteration of Elijah. For those who were not as unfortunate as me, and we're not raised Catholic, you might not know that Elijah is basically a famous prophet of, I believe, the Old Testament. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is the Old Testament. <clears throat> Associated with bringing down false priests of the pagan god Baal through fire raining down upon an altar. I cannot make this shit up because as you see in the devil judge, it's Elijah's story that is thus Johann's Ark and is rooted in a very, very specific event to which we flash back numerous times about which there is much debate for the course of the show as it basically is the starting point of really is Johann a monster or not, or just how monstrous is he or not. And that is the burning down of a Catholic church that resulted in the death of Elia's parents and ended with Johann literally pulling her out, sadly now crippled, from the smoldering ashes. It was also a scene of chaos that exposed for Johan the true hypocritical selfish faces of those so-called elites who were in power putting on a show of noblesse oblige, and I apologize if I mispronounced that to the masses. So for those who are curious, noblesse oblige, again, if I mispronounce that, I am so, so sorry. It is a French phrase, which means nobility obligates. Basically it means that with great wealth comes the responsibility to give back to those less fortunate than oneself. In fact, it is the sort of motto that is taken up by the elites and this, uh, I'm gonna blank on the proper name, but it's some sort of like, foundation for societal welfare or whatever. That's basically like rich people throwing their money in there and not giving it actually to anyone. Anyway, back to Elia. Elia is the key to understanding Johan's entire purpose. She is the prophet who at the very beginning heralds that while she might believe on the surface that Johan is a monster and basically responsible for the fire that resulted in the death of her family, deep down, she doesn't really believe him to be capable of selfish murder. 
And arguably she is right. I mean, Johan, in a move befitting a devil, prefers to create karmic ends for those who do wrong. Again, again, I already said this is gonna be rooted in spoilers, but spoilers. In the finale, he basically recreates the very same scenario in which he first met, met the monsters he wishes to defeat and presents them with the same potential choices. Fire is going to rain down. There's only one door that represents the way out. It's open, but it's up for you to decide who's gonna make it out of here. And because these elites are so inherently and disturbingly selfish, they become more interested in tearing at each other to ensure someone else doesn't get out, as opposed to, I don't know, thinking of a way to band together and like help everyone because God forbid we think of more beyond the individual because the individual self trumps all in the scenario and that's why they all die. And that's why they're all garbage, flaming trash cans of human beings that aren't like fun trash children. They are just trash. <sighs> it is also like important that Johan in the scene notes that he is the devil must also disappear with the monsters whom he battled. There will be no place for him once the vengeance is complete. Thus must uh, the actor disappear at the end of the play. Over again. I turn to Elia being the key to everything Johan. Her very existence also proves not only that Johan, while devilish and certainly no hero, is not the worst monster out there, but that there's no way he's gonna put himself in a position that would leave her alone. She foreshadows the ending fake out, and there are two of them, but really the ultimate one in which Johan, in the words of the usual suspects, pulls the greatest trick by convincing the world he no longer exists by once again faking his own death in supremely dramatic fashion so that everyone really does think he's dead. Everything that Johan did, all the way down to adopting the position of a devil, was ultimately for Elia. He let her believe him to be a monster so that she could push herself to live and not just crumble under the weight of being crippled and losing her parents. Sometimes anger is in fact the best fuel for one's own survival. And in doing so, he also let her not have to potentially live with the crushing guilt that she, in fact, was the accidental cause of the fire that killed her parents. He allows Elia to maintain her sense of innocence because that is what she needs to carry on. Again, very much like a devil character, Johan fed upon people's worst impulses and violent desires so that ultimately he could avenge the death of Yosef and the crippling such orphaning of Elia. Because in that chaotic scene in the church, there were many people who could have helped Elia. A little child sitting on a pew crying for her parents and all of these elites saw her ignore her, did not care, just kept on going because they selfishly wanted to save themselves more than like easily being able to pick up a child and take out with them. Like it really was not that fucking hard. Thus, Johan rained fire down upon those who did so upon Elia. Not for one moment did he ever willingly leave Elia alone to fend for herself. Not even all those years ago when he willingly re-entered the flaming hell of that burning cathedral in order to find her and her parents. And so when Yosef sacrifices himself for Elia and hands her over to Johan, because like there's no way he's making it out at this point, he's like crushed under a weight of burning timber and that's the only way he managed to sort of save Elia. It is from that point on, Johan does all he can to not just keep Elia alive, but to help her truly live. That is the more selfless aspect of his revenge. He selflessly threw away the rest of his life for Elia, and thus his revenge is, like I say, kind of like 50% selfish and 50% selfless, making him better than the monstrous elite who really do represent pure, horrifying selfishness. It's also why he must disappear, and Kim Ga On must bathe in the light instead. Remember, Kim Ga On is this character who is a little more naive, he's kind of self righteous, but he wants to believe that the system can work. He wants to fix the system if it's broken, whereas Johan has at this point kind of succumbed to the bitterness that nah, <laughs> nah, mate, nah. It's very much like what was said in The Dark Knight, which has been quoted endless amounts of times. Johan was the hero we deserve, but no longer the one that they needed in that moment at the end of the story. Johan's revenge is complete, and thus is the devil no longer necessary after taking away the worst of the monsters in the world. But should things fall back into the way they were before his plans toppled these like false gods or false priests of society, he can always come back. 
the devil is nothing if not persistent and in many ways also consistent. I mean of course granted in this show there's like so much more biblical stuff here from like the papal like designs of the robes worn by the judges in the live court show, the entirety of the end of the penultimate episode basically being Judas betraying Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane or Gethsemane, I always mispronounce that, the S and the TH get mixed up all the time. Anyway, that and all the other iconography naming etc. Honestly, I think we've talked enough about this. Thus does this bring us to the part that we you were all probably waiting for, the gay. No but really. I honestly watched the show and was like, they gay, right? Like I'm not hallucinating this or anything. These are all like romantic romance tropes that like they gay, right? So as with my discussion of The Untamed, which if you had not seen it, I'll probably link here somewhere. Uh, this means I'm mostly talking about homoeroticism and queer coding. I mean, I'm not even joking when I say this show like The Untamed is homoerotic and queer coding. Yes. Uh, from Johan ogling gown shirtless and vice versa, like oof, hello to that nightmare scene. I think it's in like episode, I don't know, three? Oof. Oof. Like, like, gone. I don't even care if you were supposed to be a heterosexual man in this show. Like, if I were a heterosexual man, I would still ogle a shirt is Johan. That is Jisung, which means he's disgustingly good looking. Like, ooh! Yes, I understand Jisung is a man who is married with, like, two children. I, I am sorry that I just objectified him in that way, but mm, the show had no problem doing so. None whatsoever. Anyway, from that to all sorts of like artistic slow motion touches, caresses during bomb diffusions. I'm not even joking. Like I literally am looking at this like, guys, we're diffusing a bomb. Like get a fucking room, okay? Like this show is not in any way fucking subtle about showcasing essentially the queerness of its two leads through a whole lot of homoeroticism and queer coding. I would also like to note that I'm not just talking out of my ass here, as I found at least one article that had noted apparently the original script of The Devil Judge is now available and features, I guess, all of the more explicitly queer scenes that were cut for the, what we would call the TV print, the final print. Now, why they were cut, I don't know, because this is Korea, this is not China, we don't have censorship, we don't have a ban on LGBTQ plus characters, media, storylines happening in our television. So it means I'm going to sit here and be an optimist and hope that these scenes were cut for one of the usual three reasons, which is time, tone, and flow. So basically either the runtime is too long, so you cut it, it's the tone is dissonant to the rest of what is going on, so you cut it, or it breaks up the pacing slash flow of what is happening, so you cut it. So I want to think that the director essentially believed that everything else, I believe it was a he, he was doing with the homoeroticism and the queer coding and the visuals within the show, as well as the performances given by Ji Sung and Jin Young, would be more than enough for people to get the gist. In that case, I think he's at least right. Again, the show is not fucking subtle. This is a show where everything is done with a purpose and artistic decisions are clearly not made lightly. Thus, even without the full script of backing up my first question of the gay, right? I would have believed the show itself and the director's penchant for style being paired with substance to be evidence enough that all of those many, 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 many romantic tropes utilized were not there just to bait the audience. They were not in fact coincidence, they were intentional. That being said, it's nice to know that apparently the writer gave me backup on my conclusion that they gay, guys. I mean, like, spoilers, again, Kim ga Oon was fully prepared to blow himself up twice in the final episode for Johan, so I mean, bitch, you tell me they ain't gay. I mean, shit, again, the final episode gives us two full minutes of them making heart eyes at each other in, like, a classic romance melodrama ending of, like, lovers seeing each other at the airport and, like, oh, damn, I'm so mad. Like, Jisung, Jin Young, the writer, and the director really did that, you guys. They did that for the gays. Bless. Bless. Oh, I did a lot of talking just now. So, if you've made it to this end, congratulations. Long story short, this is a really, really, really fun show. The only place that I know it's streaming in the US is Rakuten Vicky, for which I think you need a subscription to watch it, but like the subscription is super cheap. I'm pretty sure it's cheaper than Netflix. Uh, very much worth it. It is 16 episodes of delicious, very stylistic glory. Is it perfect? No. Does it have a fabulous antagonist? Yes. Let me tell you, the antagonist is a woman 
the first time she showed up on screen, I looked at that doll-like innocent face and went, oh fuck. This woman is going to be the one for whom you don't even realize how sharp her claws are until she has already slit your throat with them. Mm. It's a fun show, worth watching.